are so thrilled to be here with all of you in San Diego. And I just have to say, I was at FinCon three years ago. How many of you were at FinCon three years ago? Yeah, right? And that's, there were about 400 people at FinCon three years ago. There are 1,200 people at FinCon this year. So give it up for PT. Amazing, amazing. I just want to tell you all a few things about Her Money as we kick it off. We are, as our name indicates, a podcast for women, by women, but we are hearing from our listeners that we've got a lot of men who are coming along for the ride, and just for the record, we are very, very glad to have you. We've been talking about money as the window to life. We've talked about money and happiness with Gretchen Rubin. We've talked about money and sleep with Ariana Huffington. We've talked this week with Laura Vanderkam, who is a productivity expert, about how to make more out of the 168 hours that we all get in the week. And we have some men who've come along as well. Ron Lieber stopped by our New York studio to talk about how to raise kids who were the opposite of spoiled. We spent some time with Dave Ramsey and his daughter, Rachel Cruz, in Nashville at Financial Peace Headquarters. And we could do none of this without the sponsorship and the support of Fidelity Investments. Uh, Fidelity is a company led by very enterprising and talented women, including Alexandra Tossig, who leads the women's division. She's here today. Alexandra, just thank you so much for your support. So when PT and I put our heads together to kick off this live podcast, we decided that we were going to shine a light on some of the newest and most exciting women talking about money today. And so Although typically in an episode of Her Money, you'll get one guest today, you're going to get two. And then we're going to do something a little new and a little different, and I'm going to tell you about it now just so you can be prepared. We're going to take some financial confessions from the audience. My father was a college professor, and he used to say, if I don't get any volunteers, I am not above calling on people. So just, just be ready for that. The first guest I want to invite to the stage is Sarah Lee Kane. Sarah is the woman behind the blog, High Fiving Dollars. Please join me, Sarah. What is most intriguing? Yes, let's hear it for Sarah. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you? I'm great. Welcome to FinCon. Welcome to San Diego. I was taken with your site and with your story because I understand that your entry into personal finance had to do with taking care of a not so financially savvy ex-boyfriend. Yes. Now we're, we're not into confession land yet, but go ahead and tell us a little bit about that. All right, so when I first graduated college, I had an opportunity to move to Australia for a job. And I was dating somebody at the time. And so I decided to tell him, obviously. And he said, OK, well, I'm going to come to Australia with you. So obviously, I felt a lot of pressure. <laughs> and so I moved there before he did. And he asked me, is it OK if you foot the bill for the rent while I come over and get a job and get on my feet? So obviously, I agreed. And one thing led to another. I ended up paying for everything, the rent, the groceries, gas, everything. And I just started using my credit card because I was literally living paycheck to paycheck. You ended up with a mountain of debt. Yes. So long story short, I went back to Canada after my contract was over. He basically broke up with me over the phone. And oh, it's better than a post-it, <laughs> right? Is it better than a post-it? I think so. <laughs> and so I then decided to check my credit card statement, and I saw $9,000 worth of credit card debt. And it went, all went to groceries and trips. I paid for trips all across Australia and New Zealand for months. And yeah, that was pretty, that was terrible. <laughs> I, I know you've put on your psychological hat to deal with a lot of the stories that have come into the blog, but you started by diagnosing yourself 
financially. So when you looked at that $9,000 mountain of debt and the boyfriend who we could call a lot of different names, <laughs> what did you learn from that? So when I first saw the, the credit card statement, I was really angry with myself. I just started calling myself really bad names and I was really upset I, and I just put the credit card statement away for a couple of weeks. And of course I was still accumulating interest, I know, terrible. <laughs> and then I, it was really interesting, I, I had to move back in with my parents because I had no job at that point and I was in debt. I still had student loan debt on top of the $9,000. And really oddly enough, I just saw this book, um, The Art of Happiness by Dalai Lama. I thought I'm just gonna pull it off the shelf and read it. And I read the whole thing in less than a day and it was just an eye-opening experience for me. I actually cried reading the book and I, I don't do that normally. And it was really interesting. I actually reread it last week, thinking about it. And there was a point where the, the um, doctor who had asked Dalai Lama about romantic relationships and he said those are terrible because you're just chasing a fantasy. And so I had to stop and reread that paragraph a few times because I realized that's what I was doing. By buying things for this man, you were chasing him? Yeah, so I think deep down I knew that he was not the person for me, but I was so caught up in the idea that this person was the one, you know, he, we're living together, and I just wanted to do what I could do to keep that relationship going. And in retrospect, it was a fantasy. And so I was willing to do whatever it took, and that meant spending money on him. As you fast forward a little bit to starting the blog and to writing about your own story, but also to hearing other people's stories, are you seeing this repeat itself over and over and over again? So a lot of the common threads that I see with people's money stories is that once they acknowledged it and were basically, they basically said to themselves, okay, this is my situation, I'm gonna get out of it, they acknowledged it, then, then they were able to really thrive. So for an example, a, a man that I had met through a friend, he started gambling when he was 17 years old, and he ended up being addicted for quite a number of years. And the, his, his basically rock bottom was, he was homeless and he ended up sleeping in his office and his boss caught him. And so he realized, okay, maybe the situation isn't good, fine, I, I have a gambling addiction, and I'm gonna do whatever I can to get out of it, and so that's what he did. I get quite a few emails about women who are in debt. There was one recently where um, her husband had just left her, and so she has debt, and she was really antsy about saving, and I told her, you know, do what you can to alleviate the anxiety, and then move on to do whatever you need to do to thrive. You're essentially talking about forgiving ourselves mm -hmm. for our past money mistakes. And as I've looked at the money stories on your site, that's what I think you do for people. I think you give us permission to forgive ourselves for the mistakes that we made in the past. Yeah, I think that that's a, plays a really big part. I think for me, it, what, I didn't pay down the debt until I started basically recognizing, okay, this was a decision that I made that I thought would make me happy at that time, good or bad. You know, I ended up in debt, yes, but that shouldn't define me. Our money choices shouldn't define us. Even if you spent one too many hours on Amazon, <laughs> you know, that you did that thinking that you, it was gonna make you happy. And so once you acknowledge that and you say, okay, the good thing is I'm, I'm in this situation, I recognize it, I wanna get out of it, just focus on that. And I think if, you, if people can focus on that, then they're gonna really thrive. Last question, and mm -hmm. then we will move this show along a little bit. You say you should love your money. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Okay, that's a good question. I really feel that money, financial wellness, and mental health, wellness, and physical health are all intertwined. And so the biggest lesson I learned from being in debt and being with that boyfriend and getting out of that debt was that I needed to create better boundaries for myself and I needed to say no to myself a lot more. And so that's what I did. I started saying no to a lot of negative negativity, negative people, <clears throat> negative situations. And once I really was adamant about that, my debt just went away. It went away in less than a year. I went from that to saving half my income and I kept putting more boundaries. 
then I met my husband and we have a wonderful 18 month old and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> so, so I think loving your money for me equates to loving yourself. If you don't appreciate who you are and the strengths that you have and, and the flaws that you have, then that's gonna be reflected in your bank account. Um, you know, I'm, I'm extremely blessed. I'm grateful every day to be here. I'm very grateful to be at FinCon on stage. <laughs> so, you know, and my bank account reflects that I have a lot of money in the bank account, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so, you know, um, people I talk to who are really stressed out, that's reflected, they're in debt, and you know, that's what it, yeah. <laughs> all right, are we all ready to love our money? Yes. There we go. <laughs> Sarah Lee Kane, thank, thank you so much for sharing with us the blog. As you saw, it's high fiving dollars. What else? Where can we find you? You can definitely find me at highfivingdollars.com. And if you want to share your money story, you are just hop onto the site and you can email me. Awesome. All right. All right. We're going to turn a corner here. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I want to invite Chelsea Fagan to the stage. But as we switch here, let me just take a second to remind everybody that her money is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. And Fidelity is focused on helping women like all of us here take charge of our financial lives. We all deserve to live the lives that we work so very hard for. So visit fidelity.com slash it's time. You'll find more conversations like the one I just had with Sarah and the one I'm about to have with Chelsea Fagan. You'll find information about how to manage your money during life's biggest events and most challenging times. And again, that address is fidelity.com slash it's time. So for those of you who have not heard of the sensation that is Chelsea Fagan, Chelsea is one of the co-founders of The Financial Diet, which has, hello. Hello, which has just grown by leaps and bounds. You started the blog back in 2014. Yes, I did. And you said nobody could have been worse with money than you were at the time. So I think a lot of us would probably argue with that because we all feel like nobody could have been worse with money. I'm seeing all these nods. Nobody could have been worse with money than we were when we started. But what do you mean? So, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I wasn't, uh, when I started it in 2014, I wasn't as bad as I had been. I had a salary job. I had a partner who sort of required me to be a bit normal. Um, so I wasn't at that point, but like prior to that for at least from, uh, let's say the ages of like 17 to 22, I was decimated credit score. I got arrested because I had like suspended tags from not paying things and driving on a suspended license. I had... She says arrested like it's just, <laughs> yeah, I took the dog for a walk. I got arrested. Well, it sounds like it sounds crazier than it was. Like they were like, they pulled me over and they were like, you know why we're pulling you. And I'm like, I tried to pretend like I didn't, and then they were like, you have to come with us. Like, they didn't actually put the cuffs on me, but we're like, we're arresting you. So they put me in the car. Um, Great, I am so glad not to be your mother. <laughs> my parents, I can't, I mean, bless them, they really had to put up with a lot. But so, and then I would like, I would like take out credit cards, max them out, and then like throw them away and be like, well, that was fun, and had no intention. I was getting like collection notices, court summonses. My dad used to get, piles of mail delivered to the house that were like, he was like, I, at a certain point I just stopped looking at them, I just put it in like a black box and was like, well, hopefully Chelsea makes it out okay. And I did, but so that's where I was with money. Okay, how did you turn it around? Um, well, so when I was 22, I, uh, well, I dropped out of uh, school because I got a full-time job with a salary obviously, and it was the first time that I had regular money and I felt like I could pay off my debts. I had like a defaulted credit card that was like what was really ruining my credit score and holding me back. So I called up the you know collection agency and worked it out with them. And that was the first time I'd ever paid something off. And at that time, I also you know I had my job. I had a, a couple. I sold a book at that time. Um, so it was like I had money for the first time, and I, I saved money for the first time, which felt so exciting. And then by 2014. I was living a life that felt quite adult in every other way. I had a job I loved, I had a partner I loved, I, I had a, an apart apartment I loved, but I still didn't have a budget. And I was like, well, the last thing is clearly I have to become good with money. So I started a Tumblr called The Financial Diet. Um, and mostly because I already had a platform, it sort of took off and Lauren emailed me, as you all see. And it's the best email you could ever 
you could ever dream of. It's an amazing email. Lauren is here as well. Just wait, Lauren, Lauren. our designer, yeah. my partner, everything. It's fabulous. So the financial diet is a place where people come and talk about money, and you really are out there advocating that we really should be talking more about money. Why, why do you feel it's so important? Um, well, to be clear, we really direct our editorial to people who, like me, are sort of allergic to talking about money, would never seek it out, would never talk about it. We don't, our approach to money is not a really sort of like hardcore technical logistical approach. It's very much speaking about money in a narrative way, in an editorial way. So our view is that if we can get and, and our audience is that example, if we can get a large number of people who would never like Google what is a stock to talk about money, then that's like a huge victory because unfortunately a lot of the information out there, you sort of have to already want to look it up. There's no like smooth entree into the world of talking about it. So we talk about subjects that are, you know, sort of more fun and, and accessible. But you, tell, you told me um, that you've lost friends by doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. so take us through that a little bit. I mean, I didn't lose, like, I didn't lose, like, my best friends, but I lost, like, especially acquaintances. To be perfectly honest, I lost the acquaintances, the, like, friendly professional acquaintances I had who had a lot of money that they didn't want to talk about. Like, in New York, I live in New York. If you live in New York, you know a lot of people whose parents pay their rent and they're, like, 30, or they pay part of it, or, like, they have a source of money that they are clearly playing down. Right. Or they have a partner with a lot of, whatever it is, they don't like to talk about it. And if you talk about it, and if you press the issue in any way, and not in like an accusatory way, but if you talk to them about it in like a really active, proactive way, they get really uncomfortable and they assume that you're doing it because you're jealous, because you hate them, because you want to kind of put their, you know, business on front street, as we used to say. And uh, <laughs> they don't like it so much. So it's not like we are like, we had a huge breakup, they just, we don't hang out anymore. So what is just the right amount? Where's the Goldilocks scenario in financial conversation where you can have it and benefit from it, but not necessarily piss people off? Or should you piss people off? I mean, is that kind of the point? I think you should piss people off. I think the really, like what I always talk about on like TFD personally and what so many of our contributors say is that like, People who don't have money don't have a choice but to talk about it. Like, even if you're just being like, I can't go to this thing because I can't afford to pay for dinner. Like, money has to be a part of your conversation. Yeah. And generally, the wealthier you grow up, the more you grow up with this tone of like, it's not polite, it's gauche to talk about money, it's gauche to say what you spent on something. And it's like, to not talk about money is a privilege inherently, so I feel like you should make people uncomfortable in the sense that you should push them to be honest in a way that they're taught they don't have to be, you know? Because the people who don't have that luxury are gonna talk about it regardless, because they have to. Well, I can't afford it are four words that I think should be in everybody's vocabulary. Yeah, because there it. are things, yeah, I can't afford like, when it. When people it's pretend not... to be sick to not go to something. It's like, would people think you have like the flu all the time? It's, you know, <laughs> just say I can't afford to go to the bar. Or, or whatever. Or exactly. whatever. Or All right. So you were, by 2015, able to quit your day job, work on the site full time. I know there are a lot of people in this audience and a lot of our listeners who are like, yeah, I want to quit my day job and I want to do this thing that I'm building that I love. You think a lot of the advice about quitting your day job is wrong. So what's the right time to do it? I don't think it's wrong. I think it's really disingenuous because I think that, so. Perfect transparency, so when we quit our jobs, I had a substantial enough platform that I was able to freelance to supplement my income, um, and Lauren had been living at home with her family, so she had saved up quite a lot of money, and we could have like stopped the narrative bit there and been like, we were really smart about it, you just have to be. No, like really the two things that allowed us to quit our jobs was one, we got a grant from the Green Brothers to, to, to kind of take it into being a full business. Not a huge one, but enough to help us. And two, our partners have stable full-time jobs that allow them to pay the bills if we went a month without earning money. And like so many people refuse to be honest with that. And the truth is, when you start a business, that money is going to have to come from somewhere. And whether that's just being able to pay your rent while you're not earning income, like you could even just go live at your parents' house or you could go, you know, get bunk with a friend for a while, whatever it is. But that money comes from somewhere. Sure. And granted, we aren't on like the, the sort of high end of the scale where you have like a huge influx of investment at the beginning of your business and you don't have to take a pay cut or whatever. But like we had a ton of privilege socioeconomically to be able to start it, and that is almost universally the truth. And I know personally, 
not a, a few people in media who will push a bootstrap narrative for their company because they didn't have an actual literal investment, but like their family members were really rich or they got like, you know, 10 grand friends and family, 100 grand friends and family, and it's like, or they just didn't have to yeah, pay that's rent. That's right, like, for the honesty, right? Like, exactly. It's so frustrating to like talk to those people and hear them believe it because the narrative of entrepreneurship and small businesses is so disingenuous. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. So this whole conversation has to me, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Financial honesty. This, this whole conversation has to me sounded like a bit of a confession. Yeah. Including the fact that you were arrested. <laughs> Just to bring that up again. Um, but we want to open it up, and we want to hear your financial confessions. Kelly, who usually does the Q&A on our show, is in the audience. Say hi to Kelly. Can't miss her. Um, and I, that's not me. That's nice. You're, Kelly's six feet tall, so in flat. So it's, you know, it's, she can get things off a high shelf. Um, <laughs> she's out in the audience, and we're going to take some of your financial confessions, but I'll start. Um, because I knew we were going to do this, so I prepared. And I don't know that I've ever admitted this in public. Um, my husband, I don't know if he's going to like that I'm admitting this on the podcast. He, he and Alexandra are like our biggest fans, which I, I kind of love. But my husband's credit score is about 45 points higher than my credit score, which... I know. Oh, no. I, I, it's not an oh no. My credit, oh, no. you know, my credit score is fine. I think the financial institutions in the room will approve me for whatever card I decide to apply for next week. Um, but it re it really bothers me. Like I I I I do everything right for my credit score, and you know, and he just he pays his bills. He pays his bills on time. He doesn't think about it. It doesn't bother. So it bothers me, and that's. My confession. Do you have another one? Yes, and would also be remiss if I didn't specify that the Financial Confessions is our longest running series on TFD. It's our oldest one, so please encourage you to go read more Financial Confessions Absolutely. on TFD. Yes. Um, no, but so mine is uh, as messy as everything else in my financial history. Uh, I have so many unpaid parking, well, I had so many unpaid parking tickets and moving violations to DC and the state of Maryland that for like the last three years I've been getting my tax refunds garnished. Like they, I get like a statement that says like, sorry, you had a refund check, but you're not gonna see it because you owe the, gov the government so much money. So I didn't get the refund garnish last year, so I think it's all paid off, but my license is expired for two years and I use my passport for everything because I have a fear that if I go to the DMV, they're gonna like arrest me again or something. <laughs> they're gonna be like, uh, surprise girl. Like, so I, yeah, so that's that, um, but I have, Pledge to myself that my birthday next year, I will have a New York driver's license. I mean, you don't have to drive in New York, which helps that, but I'm gonna have my new driver's license and I'm gonna be squared away with all of my parking tickets. So and you are scaring me because over the summer, <laughs> my daughter had a job where she would routinely forget to feed the meter and she has multiple parking tickets and she says they've all been paid. They haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Good okay. to know. Kelly, what do we you have? have? A confession back here. Please introduce yourself and tell us why you're at FinCon first. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you speak okay. up a little bit? That would be great. Hi. Testing. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Crystal, and I'm actually at my sixth FinCon. Um, Woo! So, thanks. Um, but I'm at SophisticatedSpender.com, and I love telling people this. Um, I actually, um, I'm into real estate also, and I'm a landlord. I have a few units, but my real estate start was with being evicted. So um, I'm a landlord now, but I've been on the other side, and I started off as the worst tenant on earth, and I actually have an eviction. So you can start at the bottom and then end up at the top. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah. Who's next? And I know there's a few we've already asked to confess, and if you want to make your way up to that mic, that would be great. Do I have any hands? That's good, Kelly. I know you've got one that you've been. Um, I do. I was hoping to on. avoid it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a pretty self-aware person, and that comes with my finances too. I work for Jean Chatsky, so I should be, uh, except for one expense, and that's Starbucks. That's Starbucks, and I checked this morning for the first time 
how much I've spent to date for this year, and it's just under $1,000. <laughs> I know, Woo! I know, I know, I know. I'm not proud of it. And there's one right next to my seat, too. I have a problem, and I am grateful for this opportunity to come clean about it. And, and you're getting a Keurig for Christmas. I know. No, from me. From thank me. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you're not the only one with the Starbucks problem, oh, so you. yes. Good. Aaron Chase from $5 Dinners. And uh, my financial confession goes way back and it is that I, right out of college, I moved overseas to do mission work, and I was paid in Dominican pesos. So I used Dominican pesos, so for six years, I didn't have any retirement happening. And so now, those are obviously the most important years to get your retirement you know, funds going. So now I'm working my tail off to sort of refill those. So that's my financial confession. Thank you, Aaron. Coming to you. Hi, my name's David Otten, and I'm the host of Queer Money. Um, and my confession is, although I've been a quote-unquote uh, financial expert for the last few years, uh, after paying off $51,000 in credit card debt, I still struggle with budget creep. I do my budget every month. I check it on a regular basis, but I still watch those numbers go up from time to time. Uh, and I have to remember that it's just keeping track and reminding myself that my budget is there to tell me yes rather than no, and not getting depressed when it tells me I'm not saying the right yeses. Thank you. Gosh, I think I can relate to that so much. I think every, I, that's, that feels very yeah. real. Thank you, David. Do we have any others? Yes. yes. My name is John, and I'm with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, I manage our digital media team. So my confession is that uh, when I was uh, when I finished college, I had a lot of student loan debt and also credit card debt, and um, I ended up living very frugally for like a year and a half. I didn't have like a coffee table. I didn't have my TV was sitting on a cardboard box, and because of that, um, a lot of a lot of people I dated when they went to, when they came to visit, they stopped dating me. <laughs> this was like for about about a year and a half, but because of that, I saved a ton of money um, over time and. I bought two condos and so it's, it's, things worked out fine. So. Silver lining, way to yes, go. Yes. I love I this. I think we've got time for just one more, so go ahead. Wow, so this is, this is challenging. I'm excited and very apprehensive because um, Chelsea, you're so willing to be so outspoken and um, Thank you. So my. <laughs> Out of necessity. Yeah. <laughs> you can actually look up my record, so I don't really have a lot of options in that regard. Uh, my money confession has to do with the privilege you spoke about. So when I was in, my, my name's Emily, I'm um, from Wealth Legacy Group. So I work with the 1%. I work with inheritors that deal with a lot of shame and guilt around um, the benefits that they get. And they have to deal with a lot of hostile envy and kind of microaggressions in the popular culture. And sometimes they're macroaggressions. And it's, it's actually really harming us because it causes that stealth wealth. And I, when I was in social work school, I experienced it because um, I needed a car to drive um, from Dallas to Arlington. And my stepmother said, oh, my lease is coming up from my, from my Lexus. Why don't I purchase it and give it to you? And I was, no, I can't park a Lexus in the parking lot of the social work school. <laughs> and it was really, it was very um, evocative for me. And I... When I went into social work school, I didn't have any notion of working with the population that I'm working with. And it's been an extraordinary experience to really honor their journey as well and to really look at, wow, we, we all have, whatever level we have, we have our own issues with it. And, and it's a way to be able to have more compassion in that interaction. So thank you for letting me share it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And, and I want to... I want to just say to all the people who are willing to confess, thank you. And if you didn't get a chance to share, Chelsea, where can they send them? Uh, it's confessions at thefinancialdiet.com. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's confessions at thefinancialdiet.com. Or just email Chelsea at the Like, just email me personally with them, and we'll talk about it. Yeah, or just, you know, give her a call. Yeah, give call her a me. Call. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for being here for this live taping of the Her Money podcast. Again, I want to thank our guests, Sarah Lee Kane, Chelsea Fagan. I hope you guys will 
all visit their amazing, amazing sites. We want to thank our sponsor, Fidelity. Our music is provided by Track Tribe. Our show comes to you through PRX. And please join us on our upcoming shows when we'll be hearing from Stacey London, Barbara Corcoran, Susie Welsh, and Dr. Jill Biden. Please share the word. We'll talk soon. <laughs>